thank you all for being here. Noma Ikenjoku was born and grew up in Lagos, Nigeria. She holds a degree in liberal arts and sciences from St. John's College. Her short stories have appeared in Transition Magazine, Nano Fiction, Winter Tangerine, and elsewhere. The Burial. The booming orbs of the giant radio glare down at me like two bug eyes. The sound makes the plastic table giddy giddy bam under my palms. Fino. I know it will make the boys in this small festive nightclub act like they're anything but dry cleaners and barbers and houseboys and mostly just plain jobless niggers hanging around, waiting for something that will most likely speed past us when it comes if it doesn't knock us over first. Trisha, who drove me here, leaves to dance. As soon as Alabama comes on, she jumps up, waving her skinny arms around and around like a spider caught suddenly in the light so that her bangles jangle against each other. Then she starts to scream, this one on my jam wool, my jam, burying all, fo all four rows of teeth before running like a mad person and drowning in the dance space that is starting to form in front of the giant radio. She's usually self-conscious about her teeth. Too many and too small, she says. Maybe it is the drink. Someone tumbles into the seat next to me. He's wearing a tight black t-shirt stretching Louis Vinton in large gold letters across his bulging middle. His cologne is not nearly strong enough. He leans so close to me that I almost taste the fog of Igusi on his breath. He must notice my wince because he moves back to allow me room to breathe. Bros, how far? My name now Casey. His voice is a low tenor, almost conspiratorial. An open kind of star lands on the table in front of him, as if to punctuate this introduction. I don't respond, but pretend to go through the old messages on my Blackberry. This doesn't work. My phone, which hasn't been charged in close to a week for lack of electricity, lets out a loud warning. Casey laughs and asks, Your own name, Nko? Uchindu, just Uchi, I say. I hope this is the end of our conversation. It is not. Uh-uh, Ogajuna's brother, he says. I don't know how to respond, so I just smile. He's silent for a while, so I go back to my phone. I want to text Trisha to come and rescue me, but cannot decide whether a text will cost me what is left of my battery life. When Casey leans over, I hold my breath and shouts over the music. So, Archman, why you won't donate your kidney? He glides over the donates like a wink. No one I know calls me Archman. Something in my face makes him burst out laughing. He pours back his head like a sack of Gary and just lets it out. When he calms down again, he says, Nami be your person now. We talk for phone, waiting. Your girlfriend tell you say a secret. I go over my conversation with Trisha three weeks ago, soon after the mortuary director started calling me about my father. You need money, Uche. This thing will give you money. Shikana. Later, she'd gone to a nearby business center, returning with printouts that said how people could live perfectly normal, happy lives with one kidney. Y you need the money. When I find my mouth, all that comes out is, she's not my girlfriend. He continues as if I haven't spoken. Look around. I do. All the tables close to us are empty, but for bottles of Star and Origin standing unopened or half finished. Everyone else is on the dance floor. It is like the radio has swallowed them all, Trisha included, and left me alone with Mr. Louis Vinton. When I look back at Casey, his smile is triumphant. Now Casey built this joint. This place not my own. Everyone for this room go happily live here with one kidney tonight. He says, they fit even dash me the two if I agree. His laugh is beginning to grate on my eardrums. He continues, you know what in KC stand for? Kenachiku, I offer awkwardly. Again, he pretends I haven't spoken. Kidney chief, Nami be the chief supplier of quality kidneys. I get customers for Belgium, Dubai, even Togo here. The music changes to an American sounding electro dance song with the refrain one morning in September and someone yells that this is neither morning nor September. I beg change it to Dorbuchi. Everyone laughs. The DJ, a skinny sweating man with a thick pair of glasses covering half his face, reluctantly obliges. These people for Europe, Casey continues, smarting, thick kill them. 
But our people, they even drink exhaust smoke like saying nothing, they happen. I attempt to smile at this. He brings out a square piece of paper from his back pocket. It is almost black with tiny lettered notes. He writes something I can't see over a less dense part of the paper and turns back to me. How old you be? I know before ball age I talk, oh. He laughs again. 25, 26 next month. He nods his head and writes this down. Correct, blood type? I don't know, I say, it is true. No problem, we go find out. You get HIV? He laughs at my expression again. I suppose make sure now. Young boys like you, they like to run like say condom, not bad thing these days. Diabetes? I shake my head, no. Occupation? I want to tell him that I have a second class upper in applied mathematics, not from any year year background school either, from Nsuka. I want to add that I stood in for the valedictorian when he got a throat infection the morning of convocation, that I gave an extempore speech so rousing that the husband of the assistant to the deputy governor walked out in tears, mid speech. I write an Okada I say instead, for now. For now, Casey looks vaguely interested. Waiting be the other job. Nothing yet, I say, feeling slightly useless. Uh-uh, so you be Okada rider now. Seem out like I ride an Okada for now. You be Okada rider. Okada rider, full stop. No do smess me here, oh. He grunts and adds something else to his paper. He comes close to my face again, blasting me with warm egusi fumes. I notice ti tiny oil bombs on his nose, the kind that spit out yellow pus if you press hard enough with tissue. I even see the ends of the hair in his nostrils. You be sickle cell, he whispers. No. Hey, I know think so. You know look like sickle cell. Person like you look like strong man. He claps my shoulder so hard it feels like hot water has been poured on it. He writes again in his paper and puts it back in his pocket. He's smiling at me. What do you need the money for, sir? <coughs> Trisha arrives to my relief. The DJ has stuck to his American electro dance music thing, and there is an exodus of loud complainers pouring from the giant radio. Tr Trisha is sweating so much that the tips of her purple braids drip water on the white plastic table. Her bright orange lipstick has, has escaped the limits of her small mouth so that she looks like a child that has smeared nutrici all over her face. Now you be the Oga Casey. Why the question my niggas like say he be criminal? Collect the kidney, may we go, I beg. I know if he do him today, Casey smiles broadly. He knows he's a big man and he wants to make sure we do it too. Oga Casey, please now. Trisha's expression and mock deferential tone show that she has also guessed at Casey's game and doesn't mind playing along. I tell you say Uchena, my personal person, and my guy need the money badly. You talk to me, we come today. Casey sighs heavily, like we are bothering him. Well, I don't change my mind. Tomorrow on my wedding anniversary, I won't come out house go Thanksgiving for seven. He pauses, takes a sip from his can, and lets out a small belt. He beams a smile, first at me, now at Trisha, before continuing in a more subdued tone. What's in he need the money for? He won't pay your bride price. Trisha laughs so hard, I'm not sure whether I should be offended. Me, Mari Uchendu Okonkwo. No, Uchenda, my brother, from childhood. She pauses, glances at me, and continues with an unconvincing reluctance. He won't use the money burying Papa for village. Casey looks genuinely surprised at this. Bro, sorry, you. Now so this life be. Which time your Papa die? He leans over his kind of star towards my face as if to better make out my features in the dim light. Over two years now, Oga Casey, Trisha continues before I even think to reply. He no one tell anybody because the money for the burial no day. In fact, the mortuary don't they call him to come collect the body. Even relatives, they ask him where in Papa day since. No one fit believe old man go go Lagos two years, come forget himself. Casey leans back in his chair, closes his eyes and shakes his head. I'm almost sure he's about to refuse us again, for real, this time. But he keeps shaking his head slowly, like he's trying to remember something important or sad or both. Trisha catches my eyes, mouths, don't worry. Finally, Casey opens his eyes. He draws in a deep breath and smiles at both of us. 
Okay, okay. Now just for you three, baby. Oh yeah, Mr. Man, follow me. Make with they go. He finishes his kind of stab with a noisy gulp and leads me across the room towards the giant radio. As the music gets louder, I feel a sudden urge to grab the orbs of the giant radio to feel the vibration of the sound under my palms. So happy am I to finally be able to fulfill my role as Opera, a true first son. I am reaching out to touch the radio eyes when the skinny DJ gives me a look. I don't care. The net part is rough against my palm. Like a good Opera, that Uche has sent his father away very well. I can already hear people say it. Yes, yeah, so one good son is better than many rascals. <coughs> Did you hear he made second class upper at Nsuka? It has, close, it has taken close to 20 days to come to this decision, but I am certain now in a tiny nightclub in Festa blasting American music from a giant radio that it is the right one. With 450,000 naira, I will not only give my father the burial he deserves, I will also have some left of us to pay my Nepa bill or buy a second-hand generator. Maybe even shop for a new flat somewhere in Apapa or close to Ikeja and take time out to find a real job. A math teacher at a government school in Apapa is better than an Okada rider anywhere in this country. Besides, wasn't there that story about that woman who rose from assistant teacher to public school to minister for education? With the rest of the money, I will move to Apapa. I will take my time to search for a good job, however temporary, and grab, grab hold of my destiny with my two Kurokuro hands. I can picture my father saying, Uchen do my son, my only child, I am so proud of you. With that shrill trembling voice he did, like he did on the day of my graduation from Isuka. Perhaps I should start to look for a wife even, that is not too far away. The children can wait a little though. I will start my flat search tomorrow, ride my Akada around town without picking up any customers. Maybe even drive close to someone, ask where they are going, and just speed up before they can talk. Suddenly, I'm laughing and laughing, and I cannot stop. A few stragglers on the dance floor stare uncomprehending at me, but a woman in a Rihanna red weave smiles at me. I wink at her, and she turns away, still smiling. A warm feeling against my calves lifts me across the dance floor, and they amuse DJ. I would have started to break dance to his electro dance music if Casey wasn't at the end of the room now, glaring impatiently at me. We are done by 5.45 a.m. Casey says he can't have me walking around with 450,000 naira in cash at night in Festa. He'll call me and have the money in my account in a day or two. After the operation, Trisha drives me to my flat. She sleeps over on the sofa in case you need anything. Apart from some cold water around noon, I don't. In the evening, she makes a bonus soup with stockfish for me and leaves for her own flat. I spend the next few days waiting for Casey's call. The recovery is quicker than I expected. By the third day, I'm able to mount my Akada and start work again. The first week passes and there is no money in my account. Trisha tells me to be patient. Another week passes. Casey doesn't call. Trisha comes up with the idea of ambushing Casey at his nightclub. Early one Saturday morning, we get on a bus to Festac and take a taxi to the front of the club. In the daytime, it looks rather unimpressive. It is just a rundown bungalow with peeling green paint. We go to a mama puts across the road from the club, order one Fanta to share, and wait. We wait for a long time. When we're about to get up and go home, a shiny gray Lexus pulls up next to the club. A bleaching cream yellowed, very large and very pregnant woman in green and gold and cara pushes, manages to push herself out of the passenger seat. She's followed by Casey with a practice slowness in an agbada made from matching and cara material. Trisha squeezes my hand and smiles at me. My heart feels like it will run away from my chest and cross the road before me. I get up and we leave. The Fanta is half finished. The sun starts to drill a deep hole in my head as soon as we reach the road. Casey and the woman are about to enter the club, hand in hand, but no car is willing to stop for us to cross. In a mild panic, Trisha begins to call out, Oga Casey! Oga Casey! Bright yellow stops, narrows her eyes at Trisha, and clutches Casey's arm possessively. Casey turns around and stares at us like he thinks he has seen us before, but he isn't sure where. He waits with exaggerated patience until a brown bend finally lets us cross. Yes, can I help you? He asks, peering at us under bejeweled Prada shades, no doubt obtained from the same place 
as his Louis Vinton shirt. Trisha laughs. I laugh too, but I'm not sure why I'm laughing. The sound is painful. Casey's expression does not change. Organo, you forgot to pierce the money for Uche's kidney, Trisha says. Casey frowns, burying his teeth. There is a large gap between his and sisters I don't think I noticed before. He's a good actor, I think. The role today is big man, interrupted by needy, irreverent strangers in Lagos, complete with Lagos' wife, exhausted by the sheer efforts of being married to big man in Lagos. Low voice Mr. Vin Louis Vinton has been put to sleep somewhere beneath the luxurious folds of Agbada. Three weeks ago, we came to see you here for kidney surgery, Trisha begins. Eh? What are you people talking about? Trisha coughs violently, and I want to tell her to stop. This is ridiculous. She continues, No, you must o understand, Oga Casey. Please understand me. Three weeks ago, my friend here had his kidney removed here. Casey's face swells up so much and so suddenly I fear it will burst. There is no surgery place here. Uh-uh. There is no surgery place anywhere. Are you people drunk? This is a nightclub, not a hospital for crying out loud. His wife laughs, a fast pleased sound. Honey, let's take them to the back so they can see where we keep the drinks. Don't mind these ignoramuses. <clears throat> Instead of humbly asking for money, they are accusing me of selling kidney. Wait till be that one now. Am I a ritualist? The yellow woman laughs again, observing us with something that looks like pity. Somehow I know it's true. There will be no trace of a surgery place in that dark room at the back. The cold steel table where I had lain for, hour, for hours three weeks ago would be long gone. Something that has been at the back of my mind suddenly flashes across it. I want to vomit. Trisha starts to stutter, but I grab her arm and lead her away. We catch a taxi two streets down. Over the next few weeks, Trisha does not give up. She calls Casey's number again and again with no success. She texts him my account details over and over and asked me for my account number so many times that I start to snap as her. Then she too starts to ignore me and keep to her flat. I stop picking up the phone because the mortuary director has taken to calling me with random phone numbers to yell, come and collect your father, along with an impressive, impressive splattering of pigeon and Yoruba about a good for nothing child who would watch his father rot without a burial like an animal. I imagine my father shaking his head at me. Uchendu Konkwa, have you learned nothing about being a man? Life continues. The Nepal bill piles on and on, along with the estate levy and other bills I care nothing about. When the water in the shower stops running, I start to fetch water from the borehole downstairs. Most days I return from work too tired to even cook indomie. Trisha gives in to her guilt and sends me food once in a while. My father has spent two years more than he bargained for over the ground, and I am working around with one kidney because I have given the other one to a kidney thief, maybe a ritualist. I know she wants me to tell her it is not her fault, but I will not. I, I would never have met Casey without her. I return from business one evening to find members of my umunna congregated in the narrow hall in front of my flat. I recognize a few of them, De Masi, who was a close friend of my father, Uncle Tak, who used to drive me and Trisha to school in Aba with his own kids, and Uncle Charlie, whose wife my mother once had a disagreement with over buying crayfish for their businesses at different prices from the same supplier. Uncle Charlie's wife had accused my mother of sleeping with the supplier, and they had fought till my mother's death from a fever nine years ago. The old hag was still fighting my dead mother, would ignore my greeting whenever I bumped into her during the Christmas breaks I used to spend in the village with my father. I pretend I don't know why they are here and greet the men cheerfully. Only day Matthew repl replies my no, but he says it like it is an insult. I start to walk around them towards the padlock on my flat door. Uncle Tak blocks my path. Where is your father? He demands. I don't know, I reply calmly, even though my heart is exploding in my chest. What do you mean you don't know? Someone else shouts. He came here to this your house over two years ago, and now he has disappeared. I know that in the flats next to me, that old gossip Mama Bomboy will be pressing her mosquito ears to the door. In five minutes, this whole building will know my business if I don't get these men into my room soon. Young man, you have one week to tell us where your father is. The next time we come here, it will not be a peaceful gathering, Uncle Charlie warns, sitting awkwardly on my tired mattress. 
He refuses the ribbon I offer him, muttering something about children without manners these days. The men don't stay long, perhaps because of the suffocating smallness of my flat, perhaps because they have someone else to bother. As they file towards the door, they must is the last to speak. Uchendu Konkwo. I know your father, and I know you. You are a respectful child, very well brought up. No one here is accusing you of patricide. But I hope you understand that our custom demands we know if your father is still with us. By the next morning, I have come to a decision. My father will go away with a decent burial, even if I am the only attendee. And he always said he enjoyed my company. My father used to say that once you settle the big things, the smaller ones come easier. Like a good opera, that which he sent his father away very well. Yes, so once good son is better than many rascals. Did you hear? He made second class uppers and suka couldn't even get a real job. I wake up early and get my rusted ra razor to shave, but it keeps getting cut in my beard, so I give up. When I'm warming the jello fries she left, I realize the only person I feel bad for is Trisha, but I know she will get over it. I finish eating, wash my face, and put on a starched white shirt and a clean pair of jeans. In the blue light from the mosquito screen, I wash my tires, pulling out sand and tufts of grass, and blacking the leather seats with shoe polish. I carry my okada to the hall, lock my door, and head outside. The chill is mild, carrying no clue that the hamatan is really a few weeks away. I mount my okada and ride slowly. The only time I speed up is when a schoolboy attempts to stop me and haggle. When I'm past him, I slow down again. I am not in a hurry. I reach the mortuary around 2 p.m. The small two-story building is undergoing a reconstruction and the air is thick with cement dust and turpentine. At the front desk is the secretary, a pretty coarse-skinned woman with two small scarifications along her cheeks like tiny flowers. She tells me in confident, rapidly spat English that the Tilector will be with me soon. I sit on a creaking wooden bench and wait. The director, who has spent the last two years tormenting me over the phone, is a small, nervous-looking man with a bald and scalp. He looks strangely disappointed when I tell him why I'm here. I thought you would leave the poor man to rot in that freezer. Nonsense, he says, leading me into, to a room next to the one I have just been waiting in. It is already evening when I return. Mama Bomboy, who lives next door, is waiting outside her flat. She is sprawled on the floor with a noisily suckling Bomboy on her laps. Since she's just there, just smiling at me, I ask for kerosene. What's in you want you to do, she asks, detaching Bomboy's small mouth from her nipple. I ignore her and start to unlock my door. She hefts the now sleeping Bomboy with one hand, ties her wrapper with the other, and rushes into her flat. She's back with a small kerosene keg by the time my door size open. No finish ammo. I thank her and wait patiently for her to leave, but she keeps sitting there, smiling at me. I'm about to scream at her to go and do something when the, from, the front do, from the door of her flat, the sound of a wailing child bursts through. She smiles apologetically and stands up to go to her flat. I stand until I'm sure no one else is waiting to surprise me in the hall and go downstairs to my akada. My father is heavier than I remember. I log him in a black nylon bag up the old stairs, fearing with every creak that someone will come out and find us here. I feel a strange mixture of guilt and something else something warmer, and find myself almost apologizing to him. When he's safely inside, I lock my door. I drop the nylon bag on my mattress and open it slowly. My father is wearing a singlet, oily and stuck to his stomach in some places. His face is very black and almost featureless, like something a child would paint. His frozen, swollen body looks like he has swallowed the real life version of my father and his head, which was somewhat large in, la in life, now looks like it will fall off. The big toe on his left foot is missing, so are a couple of fingers on both hands. If he smells, I do not notice it. I try to take up the singlet, but it comes off with pieces of his flesh, so I give up. His hair or the top that remains is the only thing that looks familiar, but even it has taken on a sticky sheen. I think this is the first time I have seen my father naked, and a growing shame, unfold, shame unfolds me. Papa, no, I begin, but I feel strange, so I just shut up. I open the keg and pour what I think is half of it on him. I empty the rest of my shirt. The kerosene feels hot and dry. 
It enters my nostrils and makes my head feel heavy. I start to panic because I cannot remember where I left the matches, but I find the box beside the lamp by the broken TV. I carry the box of matches to my bed and lie beside my father. I wonder if Casey will read about it. I wonder if Casey has time to read. The thought makes me laugh so much my head starts to hurt again. The first time I strike, nothing happens. I strike again, and a small green flame comes on. I set it on my father's swollen stomach. The light moves leisurely up his singlet, tracing a clean, sharp line to his chest. Someone is banging on the door. You don't finish. I need my kerosene. Wait small, I call back. Mama Bomboy stops banging, uncertain. The last things I hear are her footsteps receding from my door. Thank you.